you for having me. Uh, I'm truly excited about our collaboration this year. Um, I'm excited about the talks we're going to have. I think they're very relevant talks internationally when it comes to colorectal cancer. And um, and I hope we have good speakers for you. Um, I, I will start the series, but I have asked my colleagues and other experts in the different topics that we're going to cover. So you'll meet um, a lot of uh, faculty from OHSU. And um, and I am very much looking forward to meeting you in person in December. Uh, so um, the first topic that we discussed that we're going to cover was on colorectal cancer surveillance. And um, I have prepared the slides and I did ask uh, um, uh, Justin uh, to share the slides with all of you after my talk, um, as well as if you have any questions, feel free to email me and we can continue offline chatting um, about what we're going to talk today. So an outline of my presentation, I just um, wanted to make sure that um, we cover, I mean, anytime we talk about surveillance in colorectal cancer, our mind goes right away to stage two and stage three stage, stage two and stage three colorectal cancer. Not so much on stage one and stage four, but we'll cover all those stages as well. Um, so we'll talk about intensive versus less intensive surveillance. Uh, we'll talk about the effectiveness of individual tests we have in our surveillance regimens. And then we'll cover the nuances on the very early stages and the very late stages because the guidelines are kind of all over the place uh, when you look at uh, the national guidelines from different societies and different continents. So, and why do we care about colorectal cancer? It's Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month in the U.S. We care because um, it's, at least in the U.S., it's the second cause for mortality, cancer-related mortality, second most common. And we are seeing a staggering, alarming rise of rectospinoid, in particular, colorectal cancer in the young. And here in the young, uh, we talk about people younger than 50 years of age. It's not uncommon in my clinic to have one to three patients in their late 30s with stage four colorectal cancer. And I mentioned rectosigmoid because it seems most of those early onset cancers are in that distal left colon and uh, proximal rectum. When you look up worldwide, and I'm curious to hear in Thailand, uh, colorectal cancer incidence is the uh, fourth highest. And when it comes to uh, cause of death, cancer related death is the third uh, highest, as you see from this graph over here. Um, it's, um, and really what is more bothersome is what we see as an increase in that disease, but that we cannot really delineate the cause as of yet, why we're seeing uh, that increased incidence. When we talk about stage two and stage three disease, I mean, this is, um, you all know uh, how we stage uh, cancers. What it's very interesting, and I put this slide up, is that even our AGCC, which is our American Joint Pathology Society, when we're like um, uh, put down how we um, update our stage groups, we have become even more nuanced, even with the, with the nodal disease. When I was training, and that was, I graduated uh, from uh, fellowship 2009, and I don't remember NY, N1C. At the time, we used to say, oh, we found two more deposits, but now we gave it a name. And usually that prognosticates the course of disease and uh, recurrences. So we have come a long way, and I think as we stage cancers, we're going to start incorporating in those prognostic stage groups molecular markers. Already we talk about them, but it's interesting, even if my 15, 16 years of practice, how I'm seeing those changes when they were not as common before in our textbooks. So um, when it comes to surveillance, uh, why do we want to survey our cancer patients after we have offered treatment? It's in the hopes 
that we can all increase their survival. And the, always the controversy has been, um, do we in, survey them intensively in, or a less intensive survey as will give us the same survival outcome? Um, and it's true. I mean, early detection improves survival and it's intuitively true. Like we always think that uh, if we cut it early, if we catch it early, we're going to save the patient. Um, however, a lot of our patients, even when we see them in the clinic and we do our HNPs or even our lab tests, we still can miss recurrences that we cannot see with the modalities we have. Therefore, there were there has been a lot of controversy back and forth that we are just introducing time bias in our surveillance protocols instead of truly like um, diagnosing somebody right at the time that they have recurred. The other also rationale that comes behind this controversy is that when do we survey them? Do we like randomly survey as soon as we're done with their resection, even when they're asymptomatic? Or do we start our, um, our regimens when they start complaining of some symptoms? or uh, when we see them in the clinic per se, and we have received some lab values that a concern us. Um, with this slide, I just wanted to bring up, there was a big meta-analysis that was uh, recently published and it included um, about 4,000 patients. Now in this 4,000 patients group that had stage one, stage two, and stage three. And I know so far I said what we really survey most intensely is two and threes, uh, but they did include stage ones as well. And they found when they did an intensive follow-up, and in that meta-analysis, what they included as intensive follow-up was radiologic and endoscopic tests, meaning CT imaging and colonoscopy. They found that they, they, that we would, they, they found that the asymptomatic recurrences will be detected earlier and give a chance for a curative intent repeat surgery. And that um, increase of probability of finding an asymptomatic early recurrence was 98% more likely and, not, and also uh, um, more than twice the chance to offer a curative intent surgery than not following those patients. So, that kind of meta-analysis is what has convinced a lot of physicians to do a more intensive surveillance. However, if you take all the studies that were included in the meta-analysis, the intensive surveillance protocols ranged from CT every six months to every year to colonoscopy every year and then three years later. So the bottom line is there was no one regimen that was examined. Multiple regimens and dependent on the study, what they called intensive versus less intensive, it was very hard to delineate what the um, magic potion would be, what would be the best intensive survey to have. However, the conclusion was that we should intensively survey patients because the likelihood of catching it at a symptomatic early detection and offering a curative surgery is much higher. And that um, um, it's what you what mostly we follow here in the United States and what we mostly do at OHSU. Um, in another review from Europe, uh, they found that when patients become symptomatic, and this is when we start like scanning them and so forth, about 25% of them may reach to get to a curative intent surgery. And the others probably likely, I should say, will receive a salvage surgery and not necessarily increase survival. So we would like to get them before they become symptomatic. Um, so this is now in, a, in the, I've talked about a first meta-analysis including 4,000 patients. In that meta-analysis, they included stage one patients as well. In this, and in, in the United States, we, we definitely, we will follow systematic reviews and meta-analysis. Definitely nothing replaces randomized trials, but we're never gonna put now this in a randomized trial because it will become unethical. Anytime you cut something early, we stop our trial. 
but Cochrane analysis, it's kind of our um, go to, I would say, meta analysis at this point of everything that we consider evidence based. And our latest Cochrane analysis, uh, which was published in 2019, so not as late, I should say, uh, but the latest that we have, it has found that um, with intensive surveillance, we can offer a salvage uh, surgery curative intent um, by a, uh, a, by a, a survival by a, a relative index of 1.98, so 98% higher. However, this, when it was looked in overall survival, we did not see as much of a difference. So bottom line, we make our patients better, we catch the cancer, we offer them a therapeutic surgery or curative surgery. However, when we look into the overall survival, we don't see the benefit that we see as we see in disease-free survival. Now that can, one, when they see those numbers, you can say a lot of things. I do a curative uh, surgery, intense surgery for somebody who recurred, and then they got more chemotherapy and they got some complication because of the chemotherapy, or um, a lot of other reasons may arise for that overall survival to be not as significantly impacted as the cancer-related survival. So um, this is where we are, and with this uh, kind of forms our guidelines uh, for us to continue with intensive uh, surveillance. Just want to make sure. So um, the other thing also about from the Cochrane, although this is not evidence based, it was the authors what they co were concluding apart from, yes, follow up with it intensively your patients, even when they are symptomatic post resection, stage two and stage three colorectal patients. They also um, brought the point that, yes, ongoing studies are needed. But bottom line, because we are improving in our technology, we're improving our imaging technique, in our surgical technique, I will put that in quotes, and but also in chemotherapy. I mean, um, we'll definitely be talking a lot about immunotherapy and how it really has changed quite a lot, even our neoadjuvant treatments, our adjuvant treatments. Um, because of that evolving um, pro progress in technology, in chemotherapy, and maybe in our surgical as well techniques, um, it behooves us not to offer intensive surveillance because what is true as of today, it may be not true as in two years and we may have better options for our patients. Therefore, that was their kind of conclusion. And, um, um, uh, what we uh, practice here. So when we talk about the surveillance regimen, in our lines, in our surveillance regimens, we include a history of physical exams, a, phys a visit in the clinic, in your office post-op. We uh, include lab tests. We include imaging and endoscopic exams. And I have to say, I, I wanted to go into every single one and what is the yield of every individual test we have? So I do history and physical exams. I mean, they come to the clinic a year later in, and uh, they see me. You examine the abdomen. Um, I have to say I have not really palpated post-surgically a big mass. However, I have found recurrences. Um, in my exam, I found myself um, limited. I, I don't often do, let's say, a rectal exam after I did a colon resection. I will follow it up with colonoscopy and we'll talk about the endoscopic exam. But I find my history and physical exam is mostly me talking with a patient and try to get if there are any symptoms that even in their mind are not symptoms or any signs that may make me um, want to order more imaging or uh, pursue it further. Um, and it's interesting, I, my, my suspicion that an HNP really does not offer as much, although you'll see it in every single national uh, pro professional society we have as a guideline, do like a history and physical, it's not really very efficacious. 
And um, there was one series that examined about 1,400 patients, and they found that um, um, this rise in CA, even a chest X-ray, a colonoscopy, those really resulted to um, a treatment arm, either chemotherapy or resection, but none of the history and physical really picked up either a recurrence or that to any single, you know, uh, curative intent surgery. So overall, seeing our patients is necessary. Building rapport with our patients is necessary. Discussion with our patients is necessary. But fall short just by examining the abdomen unless something very obvious is there. And when it's so obvious, then the symptoms have arisen before, and uh, and we have got that message from our patient, or it's a little bit too late to offer a curative intent surgery. So one we could take that with a grain of salt, although we we include it in every single national guideline having an HNP having a physical exam and a history. And here I have in the slide, like you see, NCCN is one of the um, it's the National Comprehensive Cancer Network. This is kind of our our blue book, our red book, every country has a, like their little Bible, our Bible when we follow the surveillance guidelines. The ACS is the American Cancer Society. ASCO, again, is the American Society of Clinical Oncology. NSCRS is my professional society here in the US is the American Society of Colorectal Surgery and recommended history and physical exam. Now, when it comes to the CA, I have a love and hate relationship with CA testing because we know that it's not very sensitive. We know only it rises in um, maybe 40% of our colorectal cancers, no more than that. Um, but it gives you that false, you know, sense that when it normalizes afterwards, it rises again, you know that something is happening. And and we do, uh, I do get testing when I see my patients in the clinic and NCCN will recommend it, and actually all the professional societies I mentioned before. What is great about CA, when a tumor secretes it, and you see that it rises with a recurrence. Um, one thing that I have to say, in Europe, when we there are many more smokers than there are in the US, in particular in the state I live in, uh, CA, we know that it's reason, it rises uh, with, um, with a smoker. The levels of CA can be higher. So you always have to have um, a trust with what your cutoff is. Uh, it does depend on the lab you send the values. Uh, here, um, anything above, and I know it can be random, anything above four in another lab may be the normal. So again, you need to know the normal range of the lab. Um, but I have accepted CA7 when it's a stable seven and I don't see anything, you know, rising. Or if it's a smoker and it's a CA10 and nothing has changed on imaging, um, just to accept it as their normal. So um, this is something that I I always like as, as I the, where I explain my love and hate situation with CA testing uh, that it can be very helpful. However, at the same time, um, it has its limitations. Um, the one thing I wanted to mention, there was one study that actually showed that the CAEA level can rise and it has a lead time, again, introducing that time bias, as I said, of 1.5 months before you see something in imaging. And particularly when it comes to hepat hepatic metastectomy, um, which can be curative. I mean, you can cure a stage four disease. Um, it's uh, CA seems to be very sensitive when it comes to that type of metastases. So um, when it comes to frequency of testing, we'll talk a little bit about it. In, in our practice, in my practice, I tend to get the CA every um, three to six months for the first two years. I would say every three to four months because they come and visit us. Um, in the clinic when our patients are stage three or the very high risk stage twos and they receive chemotherapy, that type of surveillance, that HNP, as I mentioned before, the clinic in the, the clinic visit, it, it's accompanied by a CA and it's usually done and uh, by our medical oncology uh, colleagues. More exciting, the past, um, I would say three years, 
I, I was not able to go to GI ASCO. We had our COVID, you know, pandemic 2020 and 2021, but in 2022, CTDNA was, I don't know if any of you was able to make it in San Francisco in GI ASCO, was the hot topic. And it was hot and I, I remember like discussions, I was listening to recordings because I couldn't make it, that even if I was guiding uh, liver directed uh, surgery, uh, the CTDNA, if it was rising, meant that we would not be able to really help the patient. Um, things have cooled off. I have to say, year 2023, CTDNA, still we use it. The company we tend to use is Signaterra, actually, and our medical oncology colleagues are the ones that usually order the test. And here, this graph is from a review from... Um, um, uh, from clinical oncology, and um, what is what are the what are the times in the postoperative um, um, of a patient that we get a CTDNA? And you see here, like where we expect it to go um, to decrease. You see surgery in the adjuvant chemotherapy right now. Our, our our medical oncologist, when they give a treatment of adjuvant chemotherapy for a high risk stage two, if it's positive CDDNA, they will get treatment. Um, if it clears after um, six cycles, they may stop. It kind of guides them on how long they will continue adjuvant treatment. Um, and um, some of them believe in ordering it more often than not, not all of them. And also they are finding that CTDNA is a marker when it's increasing or when we uh, see it positive. They say that it's uh, more sensitive when it comes to liver metastasis. Again, a lead time bias that we're going to see a liver lesion versus a lung lesion. So it, that's why I think it's kind of falling, um, falling out of as much hype and favor as it was maybe a couple of years ago. Um, there is still a working group in the US, and I wanted to um, mention that to you. There's actually a couple of clinical trials that are still going on with CTDNA um, about early stage cancers. And uh, there is this trial, a phase two, three trial, um, NRG GI005 in the North America for stage two colon cancers. And they, they're really what they're trying to see is the clearance of CTDNA after adjuvant chemotherapy and the outcomes, the survival outcomes of those uh, patients. So there is more to come about uh, delineating the role of CTDNA, but again, it's a huge progress from, from CA. And that's what I'm saying, like we're seeing the, of, it seems to be small steps, but really big steps in our surveillance. Um, further in the same review, um, they have the time point, the recommended minimum standard time points for perioperative, uh, perioperative sampling. And uh, when we when we get the time points treatment naive, um, my medical oncologist actually after I do the surgery and it proves to be a stage two or stage three, they really want to get it within the two weeks uh, post uh, surgical resection. Uh, here in this review, it says like four to eight weeks. Um, I think um, after adjuvant therapy, two to eight weeks, and that is what guides them, as I mentioned, how long adjuvant chemotherapy may continue or not. When it comes to imaging, I think that has been the most promising uh, surveillance tool that we have. Um, in uh, CT imaging, um, how often we get it, I mean, because we follow the NCCN guidelines, I wanted to mention here, at least in our practice, um, I will do a CT imaging three months post resection and then 12 months after that three months. So it's 3, 18 and so forth. But bottom line, it translates almost a CT chest, abdomen and pelvis yearly for stage two and stage three patients that are asymptomatic. Again, we're talking about surveillance and symptomatic. Now, if they're symptomatic before that, it goes without saying they will get an imaging um, when symptoms arise. Um, and here, what I wanted to uh, mention is that, uh, as you see, that routine rather than the directed evaluation of symptoms, postoperative CTs were likely to detect patients with isolated, potentially resectable hepatic metastases. 
And uh, in one of the European studies that was published actually in British Journal of Surgery, they say all seven patients with CT detected pulmonary relapses and there weren't potentially curable resection were asymptomatic with normal CA levels and would not have been detected. I think overall the imaging is the most powerful tool and um, when I compare it to a CA, I still, as I'm mentioning, we don't really know the role of CTDNA, but we'll see, we'll delineate it better. And who knows, maybe in two years, we'll be talking about something else. Um, but uh, I do depend on imaging and I do order imaging. Um, if patients are not gonna be seen by a medical oncologist, anyone who receives chemotherapy post-op, like our stage three patients or high risk stage two, as I mentioned, this would be done uh, through our medical oncology colleagues. Now, when it comes to endoscopy, oh, I love this topic because a lot of people say like, well, you caught a cancer, year 2019, you go for surgery for your patient, they receive surgery, it's a, with curative intent, surgery, negative margins, everything great. What is the value to do a colonoscopy in one year? When I was a fellow in Rochester, Minnesota, that was the biggest argument at the time, 2009, because we were like, if you received a very good quality colonoscopy, you were found with a cancer. If we think for somebody who doesn't have a genetic predisposition or familiar predisposition, you would expect that this um, um, a positive colonoscopy a year later. Uh, maybe you catch a polyp they did not see, but unlikely that you will find another cancer. So a lot of my uh, uh, mentors at the time would recommend three years after a surgery. So uh, looking at the data, randomized trials and meta-analysis, um, you see here that a survival benefit by performing colonoscopy at annual or shorter intervals as compared with less than frequent intervals of three to five years, um, have not shown a survival benefit. So it makes sense, the argument I was listening about 16 years ago. Anastomotic recurrences happen to two to 4% of patients with colon cancer. I mean, they're real, and actually we see them much higher with rectal cancer patients. Um, the National Polyp Study, but it was for polyps, did say that, you know, because you caught polyps in a year later, you will have, you know, an, act an acral kind of reduction of incidence of CRC because you cut those polyps because you found them earlier. No matter what, it's still, I, I practice it. A year later, I say colonoscopy. I don't expect I will find another cancer. However, I have seen anastomotic recurrences in my practice. And, and rather recently, um, I saw an anastomotic recurrence a year later uh, from a patient, but that patient was stage four when we operated a year ago or a year, uh, I would say a little bit more than a year ago, and we did a synchronous resection. So I always, and I had negative margins in my colon resection. I had um, many nodes positive, but also they had a liver met. They underwent at the same time, as I said, um, you know, a, a, a partial hepatectomy. And I was thinking like there was nothing missed before, now, they, they had a full colonoscopy, but still I saw a cancer. Now, this is 16 years of practicing and everything you need to take it with a grain of salt. It's just, it, it makes, it, it does make me pause. Was it because they were stage four disease and you can never call them cured and we need to intensively survey them? I have seen in my years of 16 years, I have not seen an anastomotic recurrence for somebody who was stage two, not high risk. There has been an anastomotic recurrence in stage three disease, and these were the patients. Um, and I remember one, it was my patient maybe five years ago, and I think Dr. Lu has joined the call. Uh, it was the one who scoped him. He had refused chemotherapy post-op. He had six out of whatever, 20 notes positive, and he did not want to go with chemo because he was very fearful of what chemotherapy may do. So. I go back and forth of the role of colonoscopy. I'm not going to change the guidelines. We still offer it here at OHSU. And I think nationally is what we offer a year after post-resection. But again, the yield can be questionable. Um, 
I don't feel as it's very it's different with rectal cancer, and I'll talk about rectal cancer a little bit later. Um, so covering stage two and stage three, if we look at in with a uh, a critical mind and eye, the studies, HNP maybe not so helpful. CA with a lot of limitations. CDDNA offers some hope, and imaging definitely to go. Uh, definitely a go. And then endoscopic exam, again, I mean, we still do it and may offer an early anastomotic recurrence and we can offer a metadistectomy with a curative intent. Um, the same guidelines now, if we take them from stage two and stage three patients for stage one, um, here in the stage, we have struggled with that. We have had multiple um, debates nationally, you know, in plenary sessions in our big national meetings about stage one disease. Overall, intensive surveillance for stage one is not covered by our payers, by insurances, and that limits limits us quite a bit. I want to mention the study that's very dear in my heart because I was very passionate as a fellow, and I looked at this, and the this is a study published in 2009 when I was a fellow. I looked at the at the a COST trial. Dr. Nelson was one of my mentors, and she allowed me to look at the patients that were all included in the COST trial. And you know the COST trial was laparoscopic versus open uh, colon resection, looking uh, if um, you know survival would be um, equivalent, and it was a non-inferiority study. And I looked at those patients, and I looked at the early stages, and I included in that group of patients stage 1 and stage 2A. And I called those early, and then stage 2B and stage 3, I called them advanced disease. And in the COST trial, actually, they did do surveillance. Interesting enough, um, they had a CA every three months for the first year, and then every six months for the uh, following years up to year five. They had a chest X-ray, not a CT chest, a chest X-ray, and then a colonoscopy at year one and three years afterwards if it was colon uh, neoplasia free, meaning no adenomas, no recurrences. And CT scans were offered only for symptomatic patients. And truly what it showed, even for the early stage patients and included stage one and 2A, uh, we had, um, we caught with it, this intensive, and this was the regimen, this was the surveillance regimen, we found out that intensive uh, follow-up did lead us to higher rates of curative intent um, surgeries uh, when they recurred, and we did have a better survival. Um, this is one of the studies that I would say, there are many other studies to quote that it's not worth to intensively survey stage one patients. Um, but this is my bias. This is where I'm coming from. This was my bias. So of course it has affected the way I practice. And I'm very curious to see in our discussion uh, what you uh, do in your practice. So after, for my stage one patients, and although there are no specific guidelines and NCCN recommends not to survey, I still scope them a year later. Um, I mean, we scope the large adenomas that we do EMRs the, uh, a year later, and I still order a CT. And then I do a peer to peer review with the insurance and the payers and try to convince them that I need to get that CT for my patient. So, so I still go ahead and do that. I know most are more, most recurrence, as you all know, they happen the first couple of years. And I do see the patients in the clinic, not because I believe my HNP is the, you know, the panacea, but because I want to pick up if there's any slight symptom that I may miss something. And I do get CAs. So, um, that's what I do for my stage one patients, and I'm sure it's very contentious, and I'm happy to hear um, your thoughts and discussion. Now, when it comes to stage four disease, I feel in stage four disease, everything is right. <laughs> it's just because it's so tailored to every. I mean, there's stage four disease and stage four disease. They can be the colon uh, cancer with one hepatic lesion or the colon cancer with liver full of disease. Um, but again, when we get them to a resection, uh, either they receive the new adjuvant treatment and we got them to their resection, then 
of how we follow them, it depends on how good we feel after that resection. Again, it's so tailored to the patient that the role of multidisciplinary tumor board, and we have them weekly, and we discuss those patients, we decide together how to survey them as a team of 20, and we have radiation oncologists and and our medical oncologists, um, our uh, surgeons, um, nurses. I mean, it's a big group, and we try to tailor to the every patient. Now, um, here um, at OHSU, again, it's tailored to the patient. I wanted to make sure that you know that CT scans happen more often than the yearly CT scans. Very likely, they will receive a CT scan every four to six months, I would say, particularly if they need to go back to treatment, it will be more frequent. And again, our medical oncology colleagues uh, usually um, take it, um, take um, take on that surveillance. I know this slide is very busy. I, I just wanted to go um, over um, what at least we follow here at OHSU and in, in, in most in most states, I would say more most academic centers, I would say NCCN is kind of the the society we go to the and the National Cancer Network is really where we uh, guide us for a lot of surveillance. And, and you see here, they still have the HMV we discussed, the CA testing, the CT scanning, the endoscopic surveillance, and um, again, no um, guidelines for stage one or stage four by Taylor to the patient for stage four. Um, it's um, ASCO has its own American Cancer Society. They're very similar, and I have it in this uh, talk so you can have it and maybe in another talk we can talk about it the european guidelines as well as more is the equivalent of the american asco as i say and they have you know guidelines as well overall in europe i, I see that there are surveillance um, regimens may be a little bit less intensive intensive than american uh, with our american society international societies but um, but still i mean there's surveillance and they kind of actually break down colon cancer and rectal cancer. And I'll go over rectal cancer a little bit because it tends to be a little bit different because we have come a long way on how we treat it. So, and then of course our professional society, American Society of Colon and Rectal Surgeons has its guidelines and the US Multi-Society Task Force on Colorectal Cancer, but that is um, more endoscopic surveillance. So, now, rectal cancer, um, I think it, it does deserve its own little part of this talk because we have come a long way. Um, we, we started with chemo radiation and then we waited for eight, 10 weeks and went to surgery. And that's how I was trained actually in 2009. And today, um, we have come a long way. We, there is no almost patient that does not receive total neoadjuvant treatment. And we have a separate talk, we're gonna be talking about this, uh, about total neoadjuvant in, entailing a full chemotherapy course and chemo radiation course, and how we decide what we go first, and then with surgery or not. Uh, we have offered, uh, we were one of the sites here at OHSU of the organ preservation trial that started at City of Hope with Dr. Aguiar, and now he's in MSK. And we were probably the second highest accrual site in the country uh, for the um, watch and wait approach. Because as you see in this image, we had this on diagnosis. And then after total neoadjuvant treatment, getting the complete clinical response. So um, overall, what does every data, like all studies that show us, this is a systematic review by Dr. Chang at uh, MD Anderson. Um, that looking at all the studies about uh, complete uh, response after total neoadjuvant treatment, uh, regrowth rate about 22%, salvage surgery 92.3%. That's pretty good. If you can offer salvage surgery 92.3% after observing just your complete responders. Overall survival 83%. And um, their fear and caution here, like a cautionary tale, they were saying, 
maybe it underestimates systemic failures, but a lot of patients, even when they receive the big surgery, you know, after we did the, our TMEs with either LAR, coloanal, APR, they still had systemic failures and they may, and they, you know, um, may pass from, and they pass from distant metastases. So what is the arm we use here? Uh, we tend to um, stage our uh, cancers, our rectal cancers with an MRI, rectal protocol. We get, of course, CT, chest, abdomen, and pelvis. We get our flex SIGs, and then we do the induction, either chemotherapy or um, chemoradiation. We tend to go with chemoradiation first because we are finding out that they have a, a higher chance of complete clinical response. But no matter what, um, if they are complete clinical responders and they're willing to be surveyed here at OHSU, we do offer them the organ preserving uh, um, organ preservation uh, regimen, which means frequent surveillance. And surveillance for two years following completion of TNT total neoadjuvant treatment, we have we alternate. Um, every three months, an MRI and Flexig. So it will be an MRI six, Q6 months and Flexig every six months, but I'm seeing that patient every three months because we alternate those tests. CA, as you see, Q2, three, six months, and of course, CT, chest, abdomen, and pelvis annually. Most surveillances, we see them, uh, they are usually mucosal, uh, so excuse me, most recurrences are usually mucosal. We see them in the lumen. We do the flexigs. We have a specific way. We do this endoscopic exam with desufflation and making sure we're not fooled by a scar. If we see any elevation of that mucosa in the scar, we consider it a possible recurrence and then we biopsy it. And from years three to four, Five after completion of TNT, so they, the first two years they passed, you know, um, good um, green light that no recurrence. We follow them a little bit less intensively with MR flexig rotating again every six months. So it's Q uh, twelve months, CA every six months, and a CT chest, abdomen, and pelvis annually. And goes without saying, they get a colonoscopy on year one after completion of TNT and then five years after the last one. So um, a little bit different here. The surveillance is not part of NC or SCCN offers that actually right now the SCCN network does mention about total T and TNT and watchful waiting as an option. But this is what we do. This is from the um, MSK protocol. This is the um, organ preservation trial protocol that we have. These are all here. I will say thank you. And I'm looking forward to our discussion and I'm gonna hit escape and stop sharing. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Liana. Um, Dr. Pong Thorn have a one important question to ask you, but in doing that, we need to upload one slide for um, illustration. Faris, can you put up the, the slide for, for Dr. Pong Thorn? It's about adenoma detection rate in BDMS and what we can improve. Um, Faris, slide please. Uh, while we're waiting for uh, the slide, thank you so much, Dr. Liana, for uh, your informative information. Uh, I actually got a lot of idea that we can do some research from the data that we have in BDMS. Uh, while we're waiting for the slide, actually, uh, the problem that we found here is about adenoma detection rate, which we look at the data comparing from three hospitals. Uh, our adenoma detection rate is somewhat uh a little bit lower and it's not uniform across the hospital in in bdms okay let's look at slide number three first can you go slide number three please okay um can you show it as a slide please green yeah, he already clicked it, but it's, the system seems slow. Okay, um, but from the slide over here, okay, thank you, Ferris. So uh, over here, uh, you can see the bovine population at risk is around 40%. Uh, 
uh, but average, we our our data is around thirty seven to forty, but not better. Uh, but some hospital actually be lower um, than average. So the first question that that I would like to ask is about what is your uh, bar preparation protocol and what is your uh, adenoma detection rate in in population over fifty years old? Do you so, have any data on that? So I can tell you nationally what we quote mm -hmm. um, and uh, in ROHSU. So the way we capture adenoma of the QICG criteria mm -hmm. that through a software that we use that is called Provation mm -hmm. and um, and how we enter it and then we have analysts that go back. Uh, we quote that if you have an adenoma detection rate and on endoscope and an endoscopy for men less than 25 percent, mm -hmm. we actually go back and look at the endoscopy's quality of mm -hmm. colonoscopies. Mm -hmm. So uh, we quote that usually for men it will be about 25 percent and uh, maybe above that, and for women about 20 percent mm -hmm. over 50 years of age. Because we just started screening at age 45, mm -hmm. I'm not sure how those rates may change is way too early. We just started that in 2021. Mm -hmm. uh, but the adenoma detection rate, I would say it's 20 to 25 percent. The thing is, is what do you call an adenoma? Mm -hmm. So I I find polyps almost in every single patient. Mm -hmm. But what is an adenoma? So an adenoma is not a hyperplastic polyp. Mm -hmm. But when I do a polypectomy, I, I don't know, although I could know through NBI, for example, like I can predict. There are the hyperplastic polyps that you classically see in the rectal sigmoid all the way down, at least for American patients. Um, and um, so what is an adenoma? So the adenoma that we consider as like the one that is either has some histology like a tubular or sessile mm -hmm. and anything more than five millimeters. You know, because there are those less than five millimeters, we call them diminutive. Mm -hmm. So. It's how you define adenomas in your study will be the first question I would have. Mm -hmm. And then what is the gender? Second. So. OK, your, your rates. 25 um, percent, I would say That's, about 25 I mean, percent is, is uh, our target. But if you look at the at the bar graph, you can see that in, in some months it actually uh, less than 25 and in some months it's more than that. So once when we look at the average, it's not bad, but uh, when, I, when I look at the number, I don't think that we perform good enough. I think you're capturing 37 to 40%, am I correct? I yeah. see BDM is. Yeah. Uh, but you can you can see the different color. So um, uh, SVH actually have the highest rate of adenoma detection rate. Uh, okay. The yellow is BPK and the green is Pyatai two. Okay. Then you can see the big difference between Smitivet and uh, BPK and Pyatai. So right now we, I, I think um, the the first study that we we're gonna take a look on that if we're gonna take a look on. Uh, patient demographic uh, among three hospitals in order to see whether it affects uh, adenoma detection rate. But then we need to standardize the protocol first. For example, by preparation, uh, time of colonoscopy, uh, the withdrawal time, uh, and review of uh, the colonoscopy through the video in order to make sure that we actually detect adenoma uh, adequately. So, yeah. Um, yes, I, I would not say you're doing poorly. Mm. A couple of things if you want to examine it. Yes, the adenoma, the, uh, the time withdrawal. You know, that study in New England Journal of Medicine, it's remarkable to me. They say more than six minutes and they included mm. one polypectomy. I don't know, anybody who does colonoscopies, I don't know if you all perform colonoscopies. We do, our colorectal surgeons here. I do colonoscopies. Mm -hmm. I do too. <laughs> When you do polypectomies, I mean, it always takes you longer than yeah. six minutes. Yeah. And so I think this was kind of random. You know, when the first study comes out mm. and then it becomes dogma and you don't, you know, question it. But anyway, I I would say after that, what is a very good test? 
mm. um, the Czech, um, I don't know, Dr. Lieberman, he, he used to be our GI uh, chief here. He's very well known, David Lieberman. Mm. Uh, he, he believes strongly in fit tests. Mm. If you want to see how you're performing, and let's say you cannot, you cannot an endoscopic quality, yes, it's adenoma detection rate, withdrawal. I mean, this is what we can do. You can video somebody or you can see them how they do a, a colonoscopy if you cannot be there. But um, if, an interim fit test, because mm. in a year and see how many maybe now, of course, there's a false positive, but it has an 80% sensitivity. The thing is a, a positive fit within like, I don't know, a year of a normal colonoscopy will make me pause and I would want to do another colonoscopy. If that's a negative test and they know how to do it correctly, so you don't get a high number of false positives, it may be a good way to examine of the quality of your, um, you know, colonoscopy, if that's your question. Um, but looking at these numbers, when I compare it with what we have here, I, I cannot say you're doing poorly. Definitely SVH, am I, co am I correctly pronouncing? Um, it looks that they they they're higher, but um, again, it depends on the population. It, it, um, there is a compound. There are compounding factors. Easy to say. Oh, it's the quality because look, the adenoma detection rate was so much higher. Mm. It's the, it's the quality of the endoscopist. I don't mm. think it's that simple. Mm. Uh, it's uh, it, it gets to be a little bit um, gray. Mm. And and the other thing, my stupid comment is that it might be the person who key in the data. Is it possible that they have some variation as well in keying in? If there is some variation in in um, summarize and putting in the data into the system, it's not the same standard throughout uh, the network. Uh, that's what I'm trying to say. Another compounding factor. Oh, yeah, I mean, again, it's what platform do you have to even describe your colonoscopy? And then when you call an adenoma, what are you calling an adenoma? Um, it could be. Um, uh, again, if there is human humans who take data and in, insert it, they're inherent mistakes. I mean, we're all human. Um, if it's a computer clean, yes, no, and they choose more likely fewer mistakes. Um, definitely that. Thank you. Um, Pung Thon, any, anything to else to say before I ask some other people on question? No, uh, it's quite clear. And uh, I got some idea that maybe how we can uh, relook at our data and standardize the data. Thank you so much, Dr. Lina. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, any side, any doctor have any question for Dr. Liana? We have four more minutes left. Uh, yes, Cap. Uh, I have a question for Dr. Eliana. This yes, is Dr. Mitisubin, a medical oncologist. So first of all, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Eliana for your comprehensive talk. So I have two questions regarding the CA. So the first question is, for the patient who have the normal CA level before surgery. So in this case, how would you incorporate the CA into your surveillance program? Mm -hmm. So if you're asking me if I understand your question correctly, if they have an increased CA before surgery, we do follow it. No, if they have a uh, normal, normal CA before surgery. Yeah, you're absolutely, we st they still get it. You're absolutely right. They're not CA producers. Um, but they still get the CA test. Okay. And uh, my second question is about this, uh, when the CA racing during your surveillance. So what imaging you prefer, PET CT or just CT? So uh, um, I should say CT, CT, not PET CT. PET CT uh, may be if our CT does not show anything, maybe we'll go to PET, a rising CA um, with a normal CT, then a PET CT may be ordered. Uh, PET CT is usually for metastatic disease. We, it's not part of our surveillance protocol. 
Okay. Uh, I for this point, uh, Doctor Eliana. So let's say if the CA level increase and we do the, the CT, and then the CT show nothing. So so when we schedule the next CA level, still every three every three months or you uh, a bit earlier to to uh, screen the next CA. And, and yes. if that CA still keep racing again, so what mm -hmm. will you do for this case? That's a great question. So um, our medical oncologists, when they see the CA rising, it's every three months, they will do it. They will do the test. If they, we don't see anything, then they may go for a PET CT. As we mentioned, this is not now a rising CA. We know their imaging that shows a disease. If that doesn't show anything, they will repeat it. Um, and if it rises again, we kind of know something is it, they're going to repeat again the imaging within three months. So every three months, you, they, the patient will receive a blood test and an imaging exam. OK, so uh, just wonder, because we also facing some some cases like this and we also offer the imaging book twice and we didn't find anything, but CA still keep racing, but with the very slow, it's not doubling, it's just like 10 to 15 and to 18, very, very slow. And that's uh, raised some concern to the patient. Yeah. And, and you know, the patient, if you're seeing that slow rise and your CTs do not show anything, and then you got a PET CT that did not show anything, at least from every study suggests that the liver will show an imaging, you know, there's a, that lead time bias of 1.5 to 6 months. And I find what is the value? We increase the anxiety. We cannot offer the treatment. Um, and our and our medical oncologists will bring those cases in our tumor board and they ask like what do i do now with this do i start chemo again you see like there is it's what am i treating a number so um i can see though the anxiety on the patient and how we want to to, to study it further and further but i'm not sure what we are gaining at times um it's a difficult problem but it will show its face <laughs> Eventually, it does show its face. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Can I have one last question before we finish this very good question uh, session today? Sure. I, I am all yours. I am here sure. uh, as many questions as you have. <laughs> I, I hear some voice. Right. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Liana. Uh, it's very interesting. But uh, we started to using, you know, like CT DNA, uh, circulating tumor cells DNA or CTC perhaps. And I I would agree with you that the the uh, most advantages based on uh, available evidence uh, would be supporting the uh, use of um, CT DNA for high risk to identify even. Uh, uh, high risk stage two patients, and and that's been uh, proven that uh, early intervention uh, based on these results, uh, liquid biopsies would be uh, affecting the uh, oncologic outcomes. So I'm not sure in 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 the states if there would be any other indication, of course, like FDA approved indication for CT DNA uh, ap uh, in clinical ap application for colorectal cancer. I, I I love your question because I had a similar question, not so much on cancer, but I was always worried about those stage one rectal cancers. We do transanals, how you follow them, and I was always like thinking, could I follow them with CT DNA or you know those polypectomies that. You think it's a polyp, but then they find like cancer in the polyp, and then they send you that patient three months later. You cannot find the scar from the polypectomy. And my mind right away goes to CT DNA, and I would call my medical oncology colleagues. Can we get a CT DNA? Because if they have circulating tumor cells, then it's from that, you know, it's from the colon cancer. So we need to do something. None of that uh, is being studied. 
And uh, actually, my medical oncologist colleagues just smile and nod and say, Liana, yes, I know you, you feel better that you surveyed your patient, but it's not proven that it, it gives any value. So I don't think we know all about ctDNA because there are, I mean, clearly in the last GI ASCO, they showed ctDNA normal, like, or I should say, no ctDNA positive because there's no normal, no ctDNA positive, and they had lung meds patients. So we need to be very careful. We get excited because we, we want something more for our patients. So anything new, we get very excited. We're like, oh, we're closer. We're fighting this. We're gaining, you know, momentum. But I'm finding that everything, only time will tell with multiple trials. I would love to have a, a ctDNA, call it whatever, a liquid biopsy, patients, particularly with uh, the watchful waiting, I, I would love to see something before I see cancer back, you know, because we have pushed the envelope quite a bit with rectal cancer. Yeah, I would agree uh, because like uh, we are around the world, we, we are looking for uh, the best possible, um, you know, biomarkers, particularly for organ preservation. I'm not sure since you're uh, I guess Oprah trial, uh, Sloan uh, trial, you made, right? No, no, we we did the Oprah trial actually kind of closed. I mean, they they published. Right. They were the second highest accrual site. So, um, if you you're gonna hear from Dr. Herzig, who was the side PI for the Oprah trial, okay. and. Uh, and he's a big believer. So almost every single rectal cancer in our rectal cancer of patients receive TNT with hopes of CCR. Um, but we're very strict on how we follow them, and they need to be on site. I I don't. Um, we'll we'll talk about this in another session. How strict we are with our MRI protocol, um, as well as how we do the flexing. It's not just a simple flexing and everything that we're studying with it. So we don't miss any recurrences. Right. Brilliant. So thank, uh, thank yeah. you. Yeah, thank, think... thank you for uh, a very comprehensive uh, presentation, as always, and uh, very happy to see you again, Liana. So good to see you, Art. So good to see you. So thank you for having me. I hope it was helpful. You'll have the slides. And I was looking right now at the chat. I don't know if there was a question about um, PrEP. Um, Miralax with Gatorade is what we give sometimes. The gallon go lightly. I saw my partner, Dr. Liu. Definitely. Uh, SuperEP, yeah. another SuTabs. Um, there, there are many in the market that can be pretty effective, but split prep is is key. So, and I'm, you know, for higher adenoma detection. Thank you uh -huh. very much for the advice and the technique. It's great session, and we can sign off now, and we can see you again next month. Thank you.